In theory, consultants find themselves in an inviolable position. They can choose what work they will be doing. They do not have to answer to a higher up. Of course, uh, that's not going to be the case if they work in a consulting shop, in which case you have your own uh, hierarchical structure within the company. But until you enter into a contractual relationship with a client, nobody can force your hand. And that's a good thing, because there are many instances where the client wants something done which might not actually fit with your ethics. Now, why is there even a need for ethics? Look, not too long ago, large-scale data collection became possible for the first time, like reasonably uh, possible. And there was this sort of Wild West mentality. If you can collect it, you can use it. So whatever isn't prescribed from a technological perspective, whatever it is that you can do technologically or analytically is allowed or was allowed. There's been a large number of cases where people collected data and used it in what is now considered to be unethical manners. And uh, as a result, there's a lot more emphasis placed on a professional code of conduct for data professionals, data scientists. How do you use data in a legitimate manner rather than a fraudulent manner? How do you do so ethically? Data scientists and quantitative consultants or analysts are in a weird position, awkward position with respect to uh, applications. There's a chance, no matter how ridiculous you might think it sounds, that you could end up playing a role not unlike that played by stormtroopers in the old Star Wars movie. There's some extra responsibility that's put onto the consultants, right? Having a personal code of conduct, professional code of conduct, ethical statement that you will stick to requires you to have one of those statements, and that can take a fair amount of work and soul searching. But it does give you protection from people who would hire you to carry out data science in questionable ways, right? You can refuse a contract on the ground that it is against your professional code of conduct. I'm not an ethicist. I don't really have formal training in the study and the definition of right and wrong conduct, but I have a few thoughts on the matter. Your code of ethics gives you a map to deciding whether an action should be taken or not. Not always uh, relating to data, but just in general. It's easy to think of ethics as just being like whatever the social convention is or whatever the religious beliefs of an individual are or even what the law says, but in reality, that's not what ethics is about. It could be that your code of ethics will contain a lot of elements that are shared with social convention, with religious beliefs or with laws, but it doesn't have to be that way, right? It's basically speaking, it's a document, a roadmap to what you consider to be a right conduct and a wrong conduct. The thing is, even if you've never taken the time to explicitly state what your code of ethics is, you are an ethical being. We're all ethical beings. You might be wondering though where a lot of our ethical uh, decisions come from. Well, in the West, there's three or four major avenues for ethical theories. I'm going to give you here a very, 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 very simplified description of these ethical theories, and I'll try to do so for various uh, groups of ethical theories, but you must understand here that I'm basically distilling years and years and years of context that I do not necessarily possess and thought like one or two sentences, right? So obviously a lot of information is being compressed out of the process. It's just to give you a quick idea as to what these ethical theories are and to make you realize that depending on where you've grown up, uh, you might not have the same basis on which to build your ethical code. In the West, as I've said, there's three or four major branches. A rule that most of us have uh, drilled into us as kids Kant's golden rule. And the way to put this, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, or do not do unto others as you would not have them do unto you. 
These aren't quite the same statements, right? There, your actions are considered to be ethical if they are the types of actions that you wouldn't mind to see directed at you by others. In consequentialism, ethical actions are the actions that lead to end goals that are considered to be ethical. So it's conceivable that one by one, the actions would not be deemed ethical, but as a whole, because they lead to a desired outcome, well, then they're seen as ethical actions. In utilitarianism, their actions are considered to be ethical if they lead you to maximize positive effect. Of course, it's quite difficult to define a positive effect, positive effect for a society as a whole, positive effect for an individual. It's not clear what we mean by that here. At least it's not always clear how we, we intend to uh, resolve the dilemma. In practice, nobody is just like a golden rule machine or a consequentialism machine. We mix and match depending on the situation and depending on our own backgrounds. Um, now, I'm going to try to do justice to influential Eastern ethical theories, but please remember like I don't have a a, ba a formal background in these, in these um, notions. In Confucianism, their virtue comes from virtuous people, virtuous motives, not from the outcomes. So it's a little bit like the opposite of consequentialism. An action is virtuous if the person who took it was virtuous. In Taoism, there you have to basically look on a case-by-case -case to determine if an action is ethical are unethical. In Buddhism, you act to avoid causing harm and to be in harmony with the world in which you live. And a lot of that is done through self-restraint. This is obviously not all there is to these ethical theories, but you can sort of see that they all have something a little different to them. Here are a few other ethical traditions. Again, the caveat, I don't have a background in Ubuntu and Tikanga. I thought it'd be interesting to see what some of these look like in various cultures. So in Ubuntu, there is tension between the individual rights and universal rights. Life isn't like an isolated thing. It lives in a, in a bigger environment. So actions that emphasize actions that emphasize solidarity between individuals and that sort of manage to balance the individual and universal rights while preserving the globality of life are considered to be ethical. In the Maori Tikanga tradition, there's a connection with the spiritual realm. And so ethical actions have to have a spiritual component. There's also a strong element of respect for all things. So if your actions respect all things, all people, then they're likely to be ethical. But there's also the idea that self-determination is actually important. Actions or ideas that promote or that allow for self-determination are ethical actions. So I've given you my reading, my simplified reading of gigantic bodies of work to which I don't really have a good and full connection. Perhaps the key takeaway here is that there are many different ways to define or determine if your actions are ethical or unethical. And not all of these ways or methods are going to be compatible. It would be worth your time and effort to try to read up and learn a little bit more about various ethical traditions, if only so you can come back and tell me, you know, the description you gave of Ubuntu or of Taoism, that is not at all what I understand it to be. We have to be careful not to over-ascribe meaning to one-liners. At the end of the day, you need to come up with an ethical statement that you're comfortable with. In the quantitative consulting context, you might have data ethics questions. Does it make sense to ask who owns data? Is data something that can be owned? If you're collecting data on my sleep habits by plugging me into a machine and determining what my, my sleep cycle is, my breathing cycles are, is that my data? Is that your data? Is it the data of the people who funded the study? Does it even make sense that the data should belong to somebody or to just one person? Are there going to be limits to how that data can be used? 
is all data usable at all times, no matter who owns it and how it was collected? Are there value biases built into certain analytics? What do we mean by that? Well, we do not code machines in a vacuum, right? Human beings write code. Human beings get together to try to solve problems and the code that we write or the problem that we choose to solve are influenced by our values. Is that always going to be a positive thing? Can we think of instances where that might be a negative thing? Are there categories of data that should never be used in analyzing personal data? Are there types of variables that you should never be using when you analyze personal data? I'll give you an example of what I mean. Let's say you have a data set containing information on a bunch of individuals. Amongst those measurements on individuals, we have potentially an IQ measurement. Here's a place where you might have an issue of value bias and a gender measurement. Is it a good idea? Is it an ethical idea to try to link the IQ with the gender? To prove that, as the case may be, men and or women are smarter than women and or men. Now, you might have the same data set, but together with that, you might have asked a question of the individuals that are being surveyed. Do you think that men are smarter than women? I can see from an ethical perspective, at least based on my code of ethics, that it could be interesting to find out if gender is linked with a belief that gender is linked with intelligence. But I really don't want to find out if there's a link between gender and intelligence as measured by IQ. I'm actually pretty certain there is no such link, or that if a link is found, it's probably related to value biases, and how we measure intelligence, more than the fact that there's actually a difference in intelligence between the genders. But the real question is, should we be asking that question? Should some of the data that has been collected be made publicly available to all researchers? Should only some of the data be available to researchers? What are the risks associated with making all data publicly available? Can these questions always be answered and if they can be answered are the answers always the same this is something for you to think about my belief is that these questions cannot always be answered and when they can be answered it's conceivable that the answer will change depending on when you're asking it or depending on who's asking it and to whom they are asking it. in data analysis in general what we tend to do is to avoid spending too much time on anecdotal perspectives. Like we favor the general. We don't focus on specific observations because we feel from a purely analytical perspective that doing so will obscure the full picture. So we report on the mean, we report on the range, we report on parameters that try to describe the full picture in as simple a manner as possible, but you need to remember something very important. Data points, measurements, they are not just marks on paper. As a quantitative consultant, you are hoping that decisions will be made on the basis of data analysis. In fact, that's your whole reason for being in this job, in this environment. But you need to remember that when decisions are made on the basis of data, they affect real beings, not marks on paper or bits in the cloud. The people who are affected by these decisions often come from marginalized groups and the effect on them is often unpredictable. There is no escaping that. It's often going to be the outliers or the anecdotal observations which suffer or can benefit the most from a change of policy. If you don't take that into account in your process, there's a chance that you might actually do a fair amount of harm as a quantitative consultant. I think one of the ways in which we could mitigate a lot of the potential problems would be to take a cue from the First Nations information governments 
centers principles of OCAP. Look, I'm not indigenous. I am not speaking on behalf of the FNIGC. And there's a good chance that I've uh, misinterpreted what OCAP is really meant to mean and why it was developed. But a lot of these, as I read them, would probably be good principles to follow when it comes to individual data as well. Ownership, control, access, possession. 